thing we have to remember, don't get excited about, is that we're talking about mostly the metropolitan area, Clackamas, Washington, Multnomah counties. When you get out to eastern Oregon. And, uh, Every opinion poll you take of Oregon, Oregonians talks about their support for good planning, their support for keeping the state livable, their pride. The people. But before that, I had been the lobbyist for the League of Women Voters of Oregon, who had a position on land use and was very concerned about land use, which also was a national issue. This is something else we have to remember. It wasn't just Oregon. So we met at 7 o'clock in the morning most every day, as I recall sit down and draft uh, what might be a compromise measure with all of the, the uh, groups and considerations that we had to sort of measure. Made, uh, uh, inflammatory speeches about coastal condominia and sagebrush subdivisions. He was talking about my folks, the little home builders around the state, <laughs> and they didn't Patrick like it. came to me and, I, and others and said, you know, he requested interim committee status at the end of the 71 session for land use planning. And I know Tom McCall, and I hate to, I'm not denigrating his image, yeah. but. <clears throat> I think Center Bill 100 has been very good for the forest industry, forest landowners generally. And the reason is that we see the pressure from other regions, California, whatever, who would love to own. It was brand new to me. And then I followed the, the legislation in the 73 legislature, very much a spectator. Um, but uh, when, the leg when the legislation passed... Let's the all collectively take a step back. And I'd just like to hear from your perspectives what you think one or, or two of the greatest achievements of Senate Bill 100 is or was, and what do you think is one of the biggest challenges now facing? Well, welcome to a discussion of SB 100 in the Governor's Ceremonial Office here at the Capitol Building. I'm Morgan Holm, the Vice President of News and Public Affairs at Oregon Public Broadcasting. It was been about three decades ago that a group of Oregonians was galvanized into action to create the nation's first statewide land use planning system. I'm sure all of you remember hearing then Oregon Governor Tom McCall citing the threat of sagebrush subdivisions, coastal condomania, and the ravenous rampages of suburbia in his opening address to the 1973 Legislative Assembly. <laughs> and all of you have had a role in uh, realizing the legislation that came out of that, SB 100. So we're going to revisit some of those days in our conversation now and find out how the state's land use system has fared in the decades <coughs> since. So to begin, I'd like each of you to introduce yourselves and tell us just a, a little bit about your connection <coughs> to the roots of SB 100. And we'll start uh, at my left here with a recognizable face in this group. Governor Atiyah. Thank you. I'm former Governor Atiyah. At the time, I was on the committee for Senate Bill 100 in the Senate. And you really have to kind of go through those times and live through those times to understand the tremendous interest that there was about the bill itself, pro and con. The the issue itself, as far as I was concerned, was important uh, in the sense of land use planning. I've since thought to myself, Oregon is the first state to do this, and yet, if you think back of history, the Oregon Trail was developed because people came out for land, their land, their property. And here, a state that has that kind of history passed the first land use restriction. The one thing I remember, among others, is that it's LCDC, this is Land Conservation and Development Commission, and through most of the history after it passed, the D was eliminated, development, and which was too bad and created some future problems during the years that followed. And there were unacceptable uh, parts of the bill. If you tried to eliminate them, you became an opponent of land use planning. Anyway, we'll get into all of that as time moves along. But thank you for joining us today. I'm Nancy Fadley. I was chair of the House Environment and Land Use Committee at that time. 
And my contribution, my greatest contribution to Senate Bill 100 is that I didn't change it a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and really, this is very important. The bill that came to the House and passed the Senate had been a result of a lot of working together with different interests. It was uh, something that may seem hard to believe when we, we seem so polarized today in uh, our political scene. But compromise has been worked out. And Ted Halleck came to me and he told me that I couldn't even change a comma. He says, <laughs> I got the bill through the Senate. I cannot hold my votes for concurrence. And so it cannot come by here. And um, I was thinking, I don't have to describe how Ted could make his point. I mean, I think he, he just had a balanced meal of not one, but two, but three candy bars. You know, that was his, his balanced <laughs> meal. And his, his language was memorable. And <coughs> and made an impression on you. And so that was my job. And so when we held hearings, I just sat there <coughs> hoping that nobody would point out some terrible error that really called for a change because people had worked together, had agreed, and so we got Senate Bill 100. Good. Dorothy Anderson. Okay, Dorothy Anderson. And <clears throat> I'm going to start a little bit before Senate Bill 100, although I was the first one of the original members of the Land Conservation and Development Commission. But before that, I had been the lobbyist for the League of Women Voters of Oregon, who had a position on land use and was very concerned about land use, which also was a national issue. This is something else we have to remember. It wasn't just Oregon. There was a national bill that never passed. And in 1969, when I was the lobbyist, there were some farmers from the metropolitan Portland area who were very concerned about loss of agricultural land, and they passed Senate Bill 10. Well, Senate Bill 10, or they worked very hard to get it passed, and Senate Bill 10 said, oh, we're going to require that every county in the state have a comprehensive plan. And they have that plan by 1973, four years later. And if they don't do it, the governor will do it. Well, of course, nobody had a plan by 1973. The governor was in Paul, no position to do that himself. So in the interim, there were these other efforts. And, and what I mainly remember, and I think others remember other things too, <laughs> is the governor McCall at that time had a land use conference <clears throat> to sort of get more interest up and, and build up some support for work that was being done behind the scenes. So as the League lobbyist in 1973, I lobbied very hard for passage of Senate Bill 100 with a particular emphasis on citizen involvement because the League of Women Voters not only cared about resource land and pollution, but we also felt it was imperative that citizens have a chance to be involved. So we worked hard for one of the provisions which required a citizen involvement advisory committee. And much to my surprise, because of course we just figured it would be the usual flotsam and jetsam appointed <laughs> to the board like, you know, a lot, all businessmen and no women and this kind of stuff. <laughs> and much to my amazement, I got a call from Ron Schmidt after the session asking if I would be willing to serve on the commission. I was cleaning house at the time, and I remember I just dropped whatever I was holding and said, me? <laughs> and finally convinced him that yes, I really would like to serve on the commission. It didn't take long for me to decide. So I'll, I'll end there for now. <laughs> I'm Gordon Fultz. I was a young, new lobbyist for the Association of Oregon Counties, actually in 72 and became familiar with the uh, land use and McCall's comments about land use and uh, we became very interested uh, when Senate Bill 100 was being conceived at least at that point by a number of folks uh, considering it and groups were meeting <coughs> and then found myself appointed by I think it was LB Day and uh, the Senate committee uh, to be on the final drafting committee to take all of the comments that had been suggested to that point and try to put them together into a bill so we met at 7 o'clock in the morning most 
every day, as I recall, to sit down and draft uh, what might be a compromise measure with all of the, the uh, groups and considerations that we had to sort of measure together, uh, to put it together in a way that, that made sense. And I, in fact, I remember the big discussion being, what words do we use to express conservation and development? So I understand exactly what that balance was supposed to be, as well as the balance between citizen involvement and some state agency desires. And that was the other balance that was critical in that system. Uh, I think probably the most significant issue that I had to address was what, what local governance unit <laughs> might be responsible for making sure that at the local level this was put together. At the time, the consideration was uh, councils of government, which were known as COGS. Uh, we had a little problem with that as counties, cities had a little problem with that because they weren't responsible entities or accountable entities, and so we selected, uh, along with everybody else, counties as being the natural unit to basically work with cities and uh, other uh, local units of government and the state to pull the plans together at that level. So that's, and I followed that on through uh, for many, many years afterwards to make sure that that piece of it was implemented. But that's how I got involved. Great, thank you. Fred. I am Fred Bonatta, and starting in 1969 on through uh, well into the 2000, I represented the Oregon State Home Builders Association. And when a call got up and made uh, uh, inflammatory speeches about coastal condominia and sagebrush subdivisions, he was talking about my folks, the little home builders around the state, and they didn't like it. And so uh, I was assigned to watch his every move. There you are today. <laughs> Good, Russ. Well, I'm Russ Beaton. Uh, I'm an economist from Willamette University, and I got involved with the original drafting of the bill with Hector. Uh, I had a grant called Citizen Participation in Land Use Planning uh, in cooperation with Osberg, incidentally, and uh, I was able to provide funding for uh, his clerk, who was a Willamette University law student that uh, later wrote a national award-winning JD thesis on land use planning. Uh, but Hector came to me and, I, and others and said, you know, he requested interim committee status at the end of the 71 session for land use planning. And I know Tom McCall, and I hate to, I'm not denigrating his image, but Tom McCall told him, no, land use planning is an idea, its time hasn't come yet. And Hector said, well, I'll do it myself. And he formed Hector McPherson's Voluntary Land Use Planning Action Group. And that's the group that, through 1971 and 72, authored what became Senate Bill 100. Uh, Tom McCall signed on very uh, enthusiastically during that time period, I might add. I also was involved in technical advisory committees uh, that implemented the bill in the implementation phase in 74, 73, and 74. <coughs> well, I'm Ward Armstrong. Um, at the time of Senate Bill 100, I, I had just left what has now recently been called the Oregon Forest Industries Council, but was actually working for a warehouser company. And so really represented forestry and the forest industry and land use planning issues. Uh, we came out of uh, a prior session of Senate Bill 10, as has been mentioned. So it was very obvious that land use was a major <coughs> issue of this time. And when a major effort uh, was formed to try to deal with what became Senate Bill 100, uh, it was very critical to forestry how that uh, legislation would be formulated and drafted and dealt with the issues that were so important to forestry. So I was uh, appointed also uh, by OB Day and others to uh, serve on that drafting committee and then continued after that to um, represent the views of the forest industry on the policy issues associated with Senate Bill 100. I'm Henry Richmond and, and I was a staff attorney at uh, Osperg in 1972, a group that I incorporated when I was in law school. And in the September when I started there, the McPherson Committee was going, Governor McCall hosted or sponsored a conference at the Hilton Hotel on land mm -hmm. use. 
I went to that. A lot of this was brand new to me. And then I followed the, the legislation in the 73 legislature, very much a spectator. Um, but uh, when, the leg when the legislation passed and the LCDC was formed with Dorothy was one of the members and LB Day was the chair, uh, the legislation was fleshed out by the commission's adoption of the statewide planning goals. That's really when I became involved uh, I proposed to Governor McCall that uh, 1,000 Friends of Oregon be formed. He agreed, and then our, our role was to uh, participate in efforts to interpret the goals, either administratively or judicially, and, and to, to monitor the implementation of the statewide planning goals by the cities and counties. Well, thank you. Again, thank you all for being here and introducing yourselves. And several of you alluded to what, what is probably the best place for us to talk a little bit about first, which is what happened right before 1973. I think most people familiar with state history think, oh, 73, that's Senate Bill 100. But as several of you alluded to, there were events that were happening right before that that really contributed mightily to the development of the legislation. And in particular, I wonder if a few of you who, who knew and worked with uh, Hector McPherson could talk a little bit about his connection to this. Why, why did he become <coughs> the key player, really, in getting the Senate Bill 100 movement going? Well, I think I can speak to that. Hector was a, had been a planning commissioner in Lynn County. He's a dairy farmer outside Albany, and uh, he noted as a planning commissioner that uh, when someone came before you with either a good or a harebrained idea, you had no basis for saying no. So Hector felt very strongly that there needed to be a statewide framework, but that the planning decisions needed very definitely to remain local. And, so. and SB 10 from, was this 1969, I believe it was? Right. 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 What was wrong with that? Why didn't that answer the the need. I think Governor Atiyah could speak to that. Just to paraphrase, <laughs> Senate Bill 10 said that cities and counties, you need to have a uh, plan for development in your community. And if you don't do that, we'll do that. Now that's a paraphrase of it, but that's mm -hmm. simply put. And so we waited for two years and <coughs> they didn't happen. And Hundred came along, which is ten times better. So there. Yeah. Anyway, that's that's where ten was, and that's what started the whole thing. Uh, Hector's interest in this was interesting to me because he's a farmer, and uh, you know I said, well, how come Hector gets so excited about this whole thing? Good man, believed in what he was doing, was intense on it. I do want to address something that when it comes along later, because I want to address it from my angle, and then then Senator, then Governor, and how we were trying to deal with it. But we'll come to that. Okay, okay. So, oh, Gordon. Oh, I just want to add one more piece about uh, Senator Hector McPherson, uh, because the other piece of legislation that I think it passed in 73, amendment in 75, was for... 101. Was it 101? 101, 73. What I was trying to remember, uh, <coughs> what, it dealt, what one of those bills dealt with uh, that he was very concerned about, that addressed, actually, Governor McCall's concerns, is that not Fred's members, but other folks were subdividing and partitioning without any services being available. No septic, no water, no roads. And that was a big concern. I'm trying to remember what bill that was that actually addressed that piece of it, but it was in those early years. Because before that time, there was no requirement. I think that was Senate Bill 487 in That's about 75. I don't know, that may have been, but Hector's yeah, concern was, in, that was that was to his credit as well, so that along with many initially. others. Yeah. Yeah. The, other, the other bill that, that may, I thought you were referring to, Marty, was Senate Bill 101, right. which Se Hector McPherson also authored, and which Senator then Senator Atia carried on the floor of the Senate, which passed the Senate and the House, and it um, strengthened uh, legislation that had passed in the 60s, uh, making available uh, property taxation on a use valuation or and then later a special assessment valuation, that is to say lower valuation than real market value, uh, to do three things. One, uh, <clears throat> the 73 legislature had passed the month before in May 
Senate Bill 100 and there was anticipation that there would be uh, extensive zoning to farmland and as Senator Atiyah put it on the floor of the Senate, reduced taxation was intended as a goodie, was the term that you used, Governor. <laughs> and uh, and it was uh, uh, intended to be uh, in consideration of or compensatory for the limitations on land use that the legislature uh, uh, anticipated. Uh, it also um, uh, was an investment in productivity of rural land. The legislature in 69 and 71 in 73 in various ways on both the forest side and the farm side said that our goal is productive rural land and the Senate Bill 101 in effect constituted an investment by suburban and rural, I'm sorry, urban and suburban taxpayers in rural Oregon by them paying slightly higher taxes so that a very few uh, taxpayers who owned a large extent of land could pay substantially lower property taxes and improve their margins and enhance their profitability and, and to try to increase the chances that there would be a future with farm and forest income bolstering the standard of living of the state of Oregon. So there were, those, those were companion bills in the 73 session, the land use and the property tax. The forestry came two years later, as I recall. Well, it was about that same time. This was a very critical time for natural resources, public policy legislation. And right on the heels of Senate Bill 100 was the Oregon Forest Practices Act. Uh, the first act of any real consequence nationwide right. to regulate uh, a wide variety of activities on forest land. Mm -hmm. In the past, there had been primarily a concern that when you harvest, you replant or get an, the next crop going. But Senate Bill 100 and the Oregon Forest Practices Act broadened that concept to protect other environmental values. So these, these um, energies to uh, protect other resources were all converging in the early 70s. And these landmark bills were passed. So it was so important in <laughs> my case and the, for the Farm Bureau and others, natural resource based uh, interests, to follow what was happening and to try to guide them in a way that would be productive for, in my case, forestry. Were those investments successful, just briefly, in, in both farming and forest land in terms of that trade off for the regulation? and, and the, the changes in the tax values, uh, did that work out the way at least it was intended initially? I, I would say ultimately in the bigger picture probably yes. There were, there were some other major legislation that occurred later and one of the areas of major conflict was what was the governmental role between land use regulation and activity regulation. That was a big, that was a big area of disparity. The Senate Bill 100 regulated uh, how the land could be used. Would it be in forestry? Would it be in subdivision? Would it be in agriculture or some other use? There, there is a wrinkle that remains today in that process, and that is when you give a special tax rate to land inside the urban growth boundary for farming purposes because in effect you're subsidizing keeping it out of development mm -hmm. but when the planners sit down and calculate how much land is inside the urban growth boundary they always count that as developable land but they're subsidizing the owner not to make it available for development and that has that has assisted in causing some of the economic dislocations that urban growth boundaries create but has it resulted in more farmland being preserved, would you say, or? At least temporarily. I, I would add the Maybe only temporarily. From 1950 to 1970, the Census of Agriculture reported that in the Willamette Valley, and this, much of this legislation was Willamette Valley focused, you know, if, in terms of motivation, if not in law, uh, 
the Willamette Valley lost a, th a third of the land and farms was not in farms in 1970. It went from about 2.8 million acres to 1.8. From 1970 until the year 2002, there was a 17,000 acre gain in land and farms, as reported by the Census of Agriculture. The other point I would make is that from 1974 until 2002, 2004, excuse me, farm sales in the Willamette Valley from the nine Willamette Valley counties increased by a factor of five, from 390 million to over 2.3 billion in 2004. In the rest of the state, in the other 27 counties, the, f the farm sales went up 2.6. I think you would have to say that um, the combination of lower taxes and a stable environment of land prices and no conflicts between farm operations and other kinds of uses has, has contributed to farm prosperity in the Willamette Valley. When population went up twice as fast from 1970 to the year 2000 compared to the prior 20 years when we lost a third of our, our farmland. I would say it, by that measure it has been successful on the forestry side, nobody anticipated in 1973 that harvest reductions would decline dramatically on the federal timberlands. Yep, I mean, 80, 85, 90 percent on some of the national forests in, in a very abruptly short period of time. And I remember when the Buter Report came out in 1977 and, and they were saying we're going to have to go to the national forest to make up for the yeah, shortfall in private land. Yeah. And I think what the one of the things that the land use laws did and the lower taxes of primarily almost exclusively the non-industrial owners was to retain the non-industrial ownerships in forest use. Fred's family owns non-industrial timber land that's intensively managed in Columbia County and the increased management of those non-industrial private forest lands, lower-lying, highly productive lands with significant volumes of saw timber inventory and helped enable Oregon to continue to be the largest manufacturer of dimension lumber of any state in the United States throughout that period of disruption of log supply from the national forests. Hmm. There's, there's, uh, there's, there's one <laughs> thing that helped describe some of the statistics that Henry gave you about farm income. We, the nursery business uh, spread in Oregon substantially mm -hmm. during that period and that's a high dollar volume per acre uh, product so we were converting hay fields and grass seed and grain to nursery products which substantially increased the income. We also planted an awful lot of grapes during that period and my guess is some of the additional farmland was was were hillsides that nobody counted as a farm until they got grapes growing on. That's interesting. I just wanted to acknowledge two other people we haven't talked much about. Uh, certainly, Senator Ted Halleck was very significant in this process, as was LB Day, uh, who I don't know will be acknowledged in this, but I but it was certainly in my mind, one of the key players in the development of 100 and, and the follow through. In fact, when LB Day was uh, the chair of the commission, and during the, which he was, after the years of creating the legislation, he chaired it. We had, I believe, as we implemented and tried to define what was in the legislation, a good balance between all of the factors we've talked about. It was shortly after he, you know, he left that we began to see changes in the system that would ultimately change, I think, a lot of the major ingredients in the system such that we've had some turmoil. Well, if you go back to 1973, can you talk a little bit as a group about how, how you got from the beginning of the 73 session to that point of balance? Because I, I get the feeling that it wasn't all a smooth road, but it also wasn't something that was necessarily all done in public. So uh, starting maybe with what Hector McPherson's group came up with <coughs> leading into the session, what, 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 what transpired as that session unfolded 
How did you get to the point? Well, you know, I, I've seen this in um, two major pieces of, of legislation, part of it having to do with forestry, which came about six years later. But I think uh, in the wisdom of legislators, and this is the, one of the advantages of having legislators with years of experience of knowing how the process works. Uh, a, a team was put together that included some of us here uh, with the charge to see if you can come up with a bill that meets your concerns so that you will not oppose it. And that's, um, you know, I think that's a secret of, of wise legislating where you, you you, uh, you deal with the major conflicts behind the scenes and try to fashion a compromise. And that's what... And the, the, the themes, you're, I think you were asking about the themes. Certainly one was conservation versus development. When do each of those occur? What are you trying to conserve? And what are you trying to develop? And do you have enough for each? And working that out was, was significant. Citizen involvement versus state dictate was another one of those big issues. Mm -hmm. The local form of governance, whether it be county, cities, or whatever, who's going to be in charge of this? And how does all of this play together? And then you create uh, an agency, or well, basically a commission and an agency, who's responsible for taking this piece of legislation and making sure that the balance is carried out in the goals and guidelines. At the same time, quite frankly, you had litigation occurring, or beginning to occur, which was beginning to define, instead of the, the commission deciding on many of those things, the courts were deciding on many of those things. And that, but those were the issues among some other issues that were at play, I think, during that particular time. Some of the big picture, looking at the big picture right now, I was on the Senate committee, and I'm one among those who were working on developing in all the contested issues. And there were many, for example, in the bill itself, the original bill itself, it allowed the state of Oregon to move our land use planning to a regional body. Why? I said, this is incredible that we would turn our own issues to a regional, which was in what, Region 10 or something like that. That's among the things that were in the original bill that had to get out. There were many other things that you wanted to get out. And so, at the same time, though, if you contest that, you were against land use planning. Well, no, I'm not against land use planning, but I'm for the state of Oregon. And so I'm only bringing that up because there were many very difficult decisions, and there were ardent supporters of don't touch a hair on our chinny chin chin business, <laughs> and anybody that touched a hair on the chin was not a good guy. But here we were in the Senate trying to develop this bill. And I said many times, I live in the Raleigh Hills area of Washington County. Anybody that lives there needs to know needs to be on these planning. And I do. And so I was a supporter of it, but I wasn't willing to just say that da uh, <laughs> So at the time, as mentioned at the very beginning, you have to be there at the time to understand how difficult this was to get a bill <coughs> You know, um, you mentioned, Morgan, a lot of legislation like this is, is written behind closed doors. This was a very open process. The, the drafting of the bill early on, lots of people came through. Certainly the hearings always had lots of people sitting in them, both before and after the rewrite. I even remember the rewrite committee was pretty open to anyone who wanted to come in and listen. But it was intensely debated and every detail was gone over. In fact, I remember one day in a hearing, uh, the, the committee was, was trying to decide between using the word elect or select. And Vic Atiyah threw up his hands and said, that's it, we finally got it down to one letter. It can't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to oh, add Nancy. that um, the reason these people were highly motivated to come up because um, 
there was a lot of citizen interest. Mm -hmm. uh, huge. A huge citizen. <coughs> and I think that uh, when we're talking about how things are today and how they were then, uh, there was more of a feeling that uh, uh, people would come out, come out of their homes and um, get involved in something like this. And so that the players knew that something was going to happen, and so they had to come up with something that we could That's just right what she said. He came over and said to her, I can't get this uh, approved in the Senate of concurrence. You've got to get it out of that phone room. That, she had the toughest job of all. <laughs> really, that was difficult. Straight face. Because of the great and huge interest in this measure. Were you sure of it when you put it through? Did, did you think it would go straight through without any changes? Did you know what the outcome would be? Well, I knew, it had to, I knew that there would not be a Senate Bill 100 if we made any changes. And so we counted votes. So as you think about that whole process, and then the bill was signed in May, late May of 1973, it began to be implemented. Here you all are, you all had a hand in this. What did you think after that big moment when the bill was signed? <laughs> what was your first reaction? Well, there was an understanding that, that there would not be an emergency clause put on the bill, and so it didn't actually go into effect until October 5. And this was to uh, accommodate a possible, as I recall it, uh, effort to for opponents of the legislation to gather signatures and to refer Senate Bill 100 to the <coughs> ballot. But I, the signature gathering effort failed, and so the measure went into effect on October 5, 73, and I think it was in November that Governor McCall appointed the commission and they held their first meeting in January. No, we Christmas. had a first meeting before the first of the year. A lot of people December. don't remember that, but we did. <laughs> it, it, it's relevant, I think, to to think about the interest groups after the compromises were worked out on the special uh, committee. Essentially, nobody opposed the bill but Jim Allison, representing the rural landowners. Uh, he was a vocal opponent all the way through the session, but uh, he, uh, at that time, the rural landowner didn't carry a lot of political clout. The cities were, were kind of unhappy that uh, the counties were represented in the final draft and and we made the counties the the ultimate responsibility for coordinating the planning between the city. To me, I never figured out how it could work any other ways. The county, their county, everybody's got a county, not everybody has a city, so I thought making the counties the coordinator in the local areas made a lot of sense. The cities were not happy about it and I don't know whether I don't remember whether they actively opposed the bill or they just were neutral on it. I think it. they were more neutral. They, mm -hmm. they, were, they were not, they were big time not happy. Uh, but we let Portland, uh, we made a, we let Portland off the hook as uh, you're inclined to do around fact, here. In fact, Neil Goldsmith wanted to come and become the 37th county at that time when yeah. that passed. <laughs> as he was mayor of Portland, yeah, at, that, mayor of Portland. At, at that time. Anyway, there wasn't a lot of active opposition by any organized lobby in the Capitol building at the time, but the tip of the hat to Jim Allison to give him a chance to refer it was was made as Mr. Richmond pointed out. And that would you say that's largely because of, of LB Day's group that brought you together to to give that legislation a thorough going over? Well there's there's no the bill didn't have the votes to get out of the Senate committee as it was drafted and and our people would have would have died in the building uh, to oppose it <laughs> if it if it if they had passed it out of committee as it was when it went to the LB Day group, and I think there there'd have been plenty of allies. By the way, uh, you said you asked us how we felt mm -hmm. when we had the signing in this office. It was not a hallelujah moment for me. <laughs> um, Usually, when I voted for a bill, I knew what was going to happen. For this, the decisions were going to be made by people I didn't know, and decisions were being made, would be made by people who had been a problem in the past, and, for, and that was the reason we needed Senate Bill 100. And so um, I was uh, 
I was nervous, but I knew that, that this was the be our best hope. <laughs> Uh, one point we need to remember is that a whole lot of the implementation was just turned over to the commission, which was not appointed till later. And the, the bill actually, uh, land use planning in Oregon was actually enacted then January 1st, 75, which, or before the start of the next session. So there's a whole lot of work to do in 74 that fleshed it out that pretty much at the end of the session, nobody knew what that was going to look like. The, the real answer to your question is how do people feel when the bill was signed is, oh my gosh, we got a lot of work to do. <laughs> <Right. Yeah. laughs> what have we created? <laughs> you know, I have a little analogy, I think, <laughs> in terms of what I'm thinking about. Okay. I mentioned I said a senator and a former governor. Well, 70, what actually occurred was that the committee went out and decided what the statewide goals were. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, there were 12 goals and four more for the coast, something like there that. There were 14 right. original so goals, and then the state Willamette had Green. 12, and, 12 and, and the coast had 16. And four, yeah. And you had to come up, cities and county, with a knowledge plan by the commission. They had to acknowledge the plan. We're talking about now starting the motor in 1973. The last plan was acknowledged my last year as governor. 1980, well, I left in 87, January, but then 1986. In the meantime, there was a battle in every city and there was a battle in every county, and uh, it tried to, and I kept pushing the commission as a governor now, get this thing settled, because there would affect a moratorium on anything. Everything that happened was an exception until there was an acknowledged plan. So this, <laughs> It was not an easy job, <laughs> even after it left the legislature. Uh, and Dorothy, but, we were there for that <laughs> first now commission. You <laughs> now you get to Go. where I was. You have to remember that most counties had no comprehensive plans. They didn't have the money to plan for planning, comprehensive plans. They didn't know what they were doing. So everybody was starting from scratch, except, of course, Portland and Salem and Eugene had very active planning programs. Some of the others were better than cities, were better than others. But a lot of Oregon had no planning whatsoever. They had no money to do this. And the legislature had enough people who were against land use planning that they did not want us to have any money to implement it. And so LCDC was having to act with virtually no money. Thank goodness we were able to get some federal funds to help support the commission. But we had to fight for every dollar that came out of the Ways and Means Committee because there were enough enemies on it that didn't want us to have any real effect or real power. And then you also have to remember that the state agencies were not very happy. This was a major <coughs> turf war. I mean, here you're suddenly plopping down this brand new kid on the block who can coordinate everything, create these goals, require everybody to follow them, not only the city and counties, but the state agencies had to follow them also, and you're asking for real trouble. So it was a struggle from the beginning to try to get everybody to work together. And of course, we had the federal government, we had federal lands both on the coast and forest lands, and the federal agencies weren't too happy about being pulled in on this either in many cases. So it, it was a real trick. We not only had to figure out what kind of goals to adopt, one of the things LB did, he, you're right, Gordon, he was very shrewd. Uh, one of the things that he did was go back to Senate <coughs> Bill 10 and say that bill required that certain things be addressed. Those will be the start of our goals, and then we will see what we need in addition to that. And so what were some of those things? Pardon? What were some of those things? Well, forest lands, agricultural <laughs> land, natural resources, pollution, uh, air, water pollution, I think public facilities. How, what was interesting is housing, <coughs> economy. Economy was one of the concerns. Housing was not. That was one that the commission added. Not a part of it. Yeah, it was forestry. Forestry was not an interim. It wasn't one of forestry lands was not one of the interim statutory goals. That was one of the gaps that the commission filled along with the housing. Oh yeah, right, right. We we fought very hard to get housing uh, included uh, in the process, and ultimately 
LB, who was a labor negotiator, was was a just a marvelous pick for that job because right. his technique was he could bring you in and slap you right to the floor <laughs> and and when you know and send you away and tell you to think about it and come back. And when you when you came back in the room, you figure if you get out alive this time, you're it's wonderful. And he says, "What do you gotta have?" And so, you know, your list is this long. And you say, "Well, I'll take that much if you let me out alive." And that was, I'm sure, he treated everybody else the same way. Uh, but that was his negotiating technique, and uh, he he did it very well. And he would call people early in the morning or late at night um, to, to run over these points that, that he's talking about. I wanted to go back to something Dorothy said for a moment in terms of it was many of my members of the county and cities that were implementing this. At the time uh, that the goals were being implemented, state agencies weren't very active. In fact, I think many of them ignored the process for quite a while. Yep. It took legislation to get them to, to participate in, in the exercise. And when they did, they were very disgusted that whatever they said uh, would be somehow ratified, would be uh, changed by, uh, by a commission that wasn't in control of them. And it even played out more at the local level. And so uh, uh, Governor Tia's comments about the fights that occurred, I mean, they, they went and raged. Our association was unanimous, unanimously supportive of Senate Bill 100 in 1973. We've been split since 1980 uh, because of these issues of, of how do you implement something? How do you have the citizens, and I, you know, I look to Henry, because Henry brought many of those suits, Thousand Friends did, into the court system to interpret the goals. The goals became so specific that there was no more flexibility that could be interpreted at the lo local level uh, by a county or by anybody trying to implement a plan with the citizens' concerns. It, it was no longer interpretable. So therefore, we found ourselves in somewhat rigid conditions. Counties didn't like that. They were caught in a, in a, in a system where they had no uh, county commissioners, no control of the system. They were being told how to implement something. Many of them recalled because of that very process because the public didn't understand that they had no control. They were putting the blame on the local level, not on the state level. And so that balance, uh, and that occurred, I think, Primarily in the 80s and the 90s, where mm -hmm. a lot of that occurred, well, uh, ultimately, as we implemented it. We created a local planning system with the state overseeing it, and it very quickly evolved into a state planning system implemented by the local folks. Right. And, and government power moves up the, the food chain, and I'm not sure we all understood that. Uh, as well in 1973 as we do today. I must and tell you though that, 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 that I've had many of our members come back and say if you could implement Senate Bill 100 as it was drafted today, if, if you could make it work the way it was intended, we would be all in favor. Exactly. <laughs> Henry, you're here to tell us your side of that story. Oh, well, so. I, I think those are all you know good points. The point I wanted to make was that uh, there, the effectiveness of the program, I think, rested very heavily on the appointments that various governors made. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's an important relationship between LCDC and the legislature. The legislature approved the commission's budget every two years. The legislature, at any time that it met, could have changed any of the statewide planning goals that it didn't like. If they felt they were too rigid or whatever, they could have changed them. And it was very important for the survival and effective administration of the land use program that Governor Atiyah, for example, appointed uh, a former legislator who was respected in the legislature, Stafford Hansel. The Governor Straub appointed uh, John Mosser, a former Republican legislator, similarly respected in the legislature, and that and the Tom McCall appointed L.B. Day, who was a labor negotiator, but who also had been a member of the legislature uh, in the 60s. And they could come across the street, uh, they were accepted, they were trusted, and they protected the program year after year after year. And I've always thought that when the program wasn't led by someone who had standing in the legislature, that it got in trouble. 
and I and I think that is a is as important as any of the substantive. You know, we didn't like this policy, we don't like that policy. It's just the quality of the leadership of the of the LCDC. Jack Faust was also very yes. strong. Did uh, he did thanked me forever for appointing him? <laughs> <laughs> Jack, <laughs> friends like that. <laughs> Great well, I, friend. I think Governor Kulagashi <laughs> understood that when he when he picked a because the program has had more some critics that were beginning to get some traction uh, on the program and he and he appointed a, a fellow from the legislature, Lane Shatterhill, to run currently and and I sense that the waters have calmed a little bit since he has done that. How about the citizen involvement piece, though? Are people as involved with the, the system today as they were no. in those early years? No. You I know, think I, that's I, uh, I was interested in Dorothy uh, commenting about the genesis of that. It happened that after the legislation passed, I was appointed to the statewide citizen advisory committee. And but in the in the legislation that, that we put together in the small committee, it specifically provided for citizen involvement. Oh, yeah. a very important to LB Day. Frankly, it was it was very important to Fred Venata too, because I had seen too many drafts of comprehensive plans, at least in the Salem area, where the planners would go to the closet with their magic markers, you know, make up the zoning for the land and then bring it out and say this is what we're going to do and after they marked it up it would never change and my goal was to get them out of the closet and talk about it before they colored the maps that's the only way you were going to have any effect on it. I was a big supporter of citizen involvement now after 387 lawsuits by Henry Richmond, I became, <laughs> I, I tried to rethink that position. I'm going to have to read that now. <laughs> well, let me go back but, to my, let but me. that was the reason, that, that was one of the reasons yeah. citizen involvement was there. Uh, let me go back to my, my part of the story though, because it's, it's probably part of the frustration that, that maybe a number of people have felt. We, uh, we had a very active statewide committee. Uh, we traveled around the state. We had meetings in Klamath Falls and Cascade Locks, and I'm not sure we, we got around the state. And part of our goal was to form county, uh, establish a process for county citizen involvement. And city also. And sorry. And city also. And city. Right. Yeah. It was. Uh, it was frankly, as I think back on that effort, probably a, a significant frustration of that policy direction. It didn't achieve what I think I'd be interested, Dorothy, in what you think of the result. I'm not sure much, nearly as much happened substantively as we had hoped because we wanted a very strong citizen involvement process. I think for a while it did. Uh, you have to remember too, going back a little bit, that when we were working on the goals, we had an extensive citizen involvement program, the commission did. Right because we went all over the state three times <laughs> meeting with not only the county commissioners and the city mayor and planning commission and city council, but also we had these open meetings where people would come and sit around tables and talk about what they cared about, what they wanted to protect, what they thought the goals would include. And it was extremely extensive. So the, and we got lots of people out some of them didn't like us, but most of them were right, ready to take part in the process. And for example, the people in Eastern Oregon said, why don't you people in the Willamette Valley protect your agricultural land, huh? <laughs> you got better land than we've got here. And they cared about the coast to a great extent, which kind of surprised me. In the early years, the citizen involvement banner flew under the phrase, land as a resource, not a commodity. Now that's a high sounding philosophical phrase and everybody can wander excitedly up and down the Capitol heading for the three o'clock hearings, you know, as they, as, they, as they spouted that. Well, that's the philosophical banner. And, but later on, of course, when planners get a hold of it and lawyers get a hold of it and interest groups get a hold of it, I think never was more appropriate the phrase, the devil is in the details. Well, but also it's called people in the land. That's the way we talked people about it when we sure. went around first. But then there were these 
required citizen involvement committees at the local level, and this gets back to the original question about how did they work afterwards, I think for a while they worked extremely well, at least they did in my experience. But then local governments got into financial problems, and they couldn't afford the staff, and the citizens really needed somebody to sort of keep them organized, call the meetings, take minutes, and the cities found this and the counties found this more and more of a problem, and I think that was a lot of the difficulty with the collapse of the Governor, system. Yeah. Well, what I want to mention is something that Fred mentioned earlier about the red uh, felt pen and the green felt pen and the pink felt pen. And I've talked to these planners a number of times, and I said, there's human beings under that pen you're just now using to think about that. But think about this for a moment. There are 36 counties in Oregon. How many cities? 241. Two How much? 241. 41 cities. And they all need a planner. There weren't that many planners in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> the young man that I knew, the young man, right. And they called me, we got to talk, and he said, I'm the, I'm the new planner for Columbia County. He had absolutely no history or knowledge about land use planning. He was the planner for Columbia County. Because where are they going to get these planners? Those are things that are the real life that happens after all of these great <laughs> things we talk about and all this land use planning. There is a real life human beings are being treated by these folks with the felt pens. And it created, oh, there's so many problems that were created. That'll bring you up to date to 37, so now you go ahead. Well, some of that did lead to even some repeal efforts on the ballot, uh, and none of which were successful. There were efforts in the legislature to go in and, and change these things. What, what, from your perspectives, what do you think drove people to at least test the waters on trying to either repeal Senate Bill 100 or make some major changes in the way it was implemented, just if you can think of any examples of the one of the 20 years. One of the problems that remains today is that essentially everything outside the city is prime agricultural land or prime forest land. Now, Henry can tell you exactly how many acres were in the exception area, but however many they are, they're not very many cons considering the 96,000 square miles in the state. And we took an awful lot of land that nobody could raise trees on or farm and classified it as prime land. And that has been a continuing source of controversy over the years. We now probably try to call it secondary, secondary lands, lands, but, yes. right. but nobody, can, uh, nobody can agree on the definition. And, uh, and that, has, that has been a wrinkle that has caused uh, a lot of the dissatisfaction and, and generated some of the efforts to repeal the bill. I think building on that, the exceptions and the ways in which people at least perceive they can be hurt are many. And it, it, is, it is a process incredibly susceptible to anecdotal problems mm -hmm. where somebody is hurt a little bit, maybe a lot, but usually a little bit, and that can be blown I think, in my opinion, out of proportion to a need to respond legislatively when it's much more often the exception rather than the rule. Mm -hmm. One of the things we've got to remember is a whole lot of people have been made very wealthy uh, by land use planning as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the windfalls and wipeouts issue, which was discussed in the drafting of the bill, and then there have been two or three attempts to, to create a compensation system whereby uh, people who are hurt by the bill, uh, or by, by land use planning. It isn't the bill that's hurting them, it's the implementation <coughs> of some local plan. Uh, and, and, and how to compensate them. This is, of course, the, the genesis of the ballot measure 37 uh, debate. And it is, how do you compensate them? Well, there have been attempts to impose capital gains tax on, on, the, on real estate transfer taxes, things like this, whereby the the immense amount of, of value created by planning and zoning, because to my mind as an economist, it is planning is merely a perfection of property rights. And you cannot exchange property rights in a market process unless the property rights are very clear. And land use planning, correctly applied, 
can define those property rights to where the owner of that property has a more valuable asset than he had before. And yet, in drafting Senate Bill 100 initially, was there was that recognized? I mean, was it contemplated that this would need to be addressed? It was contemplated that, that it would need to be, but it wasn't done. There was a specific provision in the original bill that <coughs> instructed the legislature right. to develop a compensation system for people whose property was devalued by the application of the bill. And that, uh, the failure to accomplish that I, has plagued the the, the <coughs> system all along the way. and. Uh, the, I tried many sessions to get such traction on such bill. I got one out of the, out of the House committee once, but it we never uh, it had no attention on the House floor and, and died. Uh, Rod Johnson from uh, Roseburg got a what I'd consider a nothing burger bill passed, and Governor Kitzhaber went up to the Rose Garden and very publicly. Uh, insulted everybody who, who thought it was a good idea and vetoed it. Uh, and if that hadn't happened, why, uh, if was, if that was on the books, there'd be no Measure Seven or Measure Thirty Seven. But the failure to deal and and Tom McCall, had, uh, and I believed him, said always he was a strong supporter of the compensation issue. I I presumed he was, you know, I I thought he was sincere about it, but. It never happened, and Henry Richmond probably knows the politics of why it didn't happen better than any of us here. But uh, it was contemplated, but nobody knew exactly what, how it was going to take form when it was implemented. I mean, it took a few years to find out how it was going to be implemented because, again, the, the feeling was with citizen involvement, you'd be able to uh, have some flexibility. As that as that began to erode we begin to see more pressure. The other pressure that I think is interesting, and you can get back to this point on compensation, was that this system called for groups that had formally come to the state to get policy decisions to go to the local level right. and try to get their stuff done it in 36 different counties. That a lot of folks didn't like. They wanted to come to a central place, to a legislature, and get it all taken care of. And so we upset the former system of how policy was created in the land use, and that, that was another pressure, I think, that added to some of the concerns. What was your take on all of that as it unfolded? Well, I think there, there definitely was a provision in Senate Bill 100 that called for a study of study. compensation by the Joint Legislative Committee on Land Use, which uh, was a standing interim committee for, I don't know, 10 or 15 mm -hmm. years, something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They took it up, and uh, they sort of broke their pick on it and, and couldn't come up with anything. Um, Governor McCall was very intrigued by this windfall for wipeouts right. thing, which was very fashionable in the early 70s. There was a law professor at UCLA who wrote a book about it, and Hagman. I think he even came up to this Don Hagman. He came Tom up Hagman. and testified. And but uh, at the toward the end of the session, um, uh, Bob um, Local Government Affairs, Logan. 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 Bob Logan, Logan came and testified right. on the bill, Senate Bill 849 and said, uh, speaking for the governor, that it was, quote, not necessary. Uh, I don't know whether that occurred after Senate Bill 101 was passed or not, but I know if Hector were here, he would say that, and many farmers would say, members of the Farm Bureau would say that we made a deal with the legislature. We got zoning and we got a tax break, and that was our compensation. That doesn't work for everybody, but I know many farmers believe that. Um, certainly the board of the Polk County Farm Bureau, which is meeting right now at Farrell's Cafe over in Rick Real, which I <laughs> usually go to those meetings. But um, I think that we got a little bit off the track when zoning got to be misused. I don't think it was misused on farmland. I think zoning on, on farmland where you can make a living on, on farming is like zoning on residential. It was a, there's a doctrine called reciprocity of advantage uh, that, that has supported restrictions on residential property in cities for 75 years, 80 years in this country. And has your property been reduced in value if you're limited to residential? Yes. You can't sell it for a grocery store or a steel mill or something that where you could make a fortune. But the courts and legislature have upheld 
against property rights attack residential zoning because this property owner's burden is this property owner's benefit and this property owner's benefit is this property owner's burden. They all, they're all ahead of the game the same way that they're disadvantaged a little bit. It works the same way with the farmers. They, yes, they can't sell out for subdivisions, but their ability to farm is enhanced and they have lower taxes. This is why farmland values, because farming has been profitable, farmland values have gone up faster than the Standard & Poor's yeah. index in the Willamette Valley since 1965. If you sold your farmland in, 19, in the mid-60s, before all this land use planning went into business, and you said, I'm gonna put, give my money to Merrill Lynch, and I'm gonna prepare for my retirement, you would have less money in the bank today than if you held onto your land and you sold it in 2006 to another farmer and used the proceeds of that sale to retire on. The idea that land use regulations have socked rural land values, certainly in the Willamette Valley and in most other areas of the state, there's one region where my statement isn't true. The idea that land use planning has wiped out these rural landowners is false. Their land values have gone up faster than bond stocks and bonds for 40 years in Oregon. You know, and the, and the, and the farmland values in Oregon have gone up faster than farmland values in California <laughs> and in Idaho and in Washington. Building on that, um, a couple of colleagues at Willamette and I did a study in 1976 on the economic impact of the urban growth boundary of Salem, which was not yet adopted. It was one of the later ones uh, that Governor Kia referred to. And expecting to find that land values have been bid up inside the boundary and depressed outside, the first thing we found statistically was that land values were bid up outside the boundary, higher. And it was because people who wanted to have a rural home site, you know, the ranchette, uh, whatever, there are all kinds of names for it, hobby farm, uh, had said, okay, there's the boundary and that's how far out I have to go to get a rural property. And the properties outside immediately in the short run were bid up faster than the land inside. Morgan, you ask about why attacks on our land use planning system. And um, it seems to me when you look at all the public opinion polls show that people support land. They want a good place to live. They want their place to be livable. But more and more, and I think we saw it at the last, the 37, yeah, they don't trust government. And this is part of what made me nervous at first because of who would be making these decisions. And some of these decisions have been bureaucratic and autocratic. And it doesn't take long for one bad story to, to get around and to multiply. And um, the fact that we were able to uh, defeat initiatives that tried to uh, repeal Senate Bill 100 uh, until recently, uh, I think has to do with the growing mistrust of, of government. I think these comments maybe can lead us to a point where we can come up to a break here. Maybe to get there, though, let's all collectively take a step back. And I'd just like to hear from your perspectives what you think one or, or two of the greatest achievements of Senate Bill 100 is or was, and what do you think is one of the biggest challenges now facing the state of Oregon in continuing that system? And let's, let's just run through everybody on that and see, see where we stand at that point. Let's start with Governor Atiyah. The, the benefit, I would say, in terms of now I'm going to be a governor and say to you that we had a recession, we had uh, a difficult time in trying to grow business in Oregon, which means jobs. And when we had a land use problem, people didn't know where they could put a plant, and it was a hindrance. However, once the plan was developed, I used it actually as a positive, and I would say to companies, you can come to Oregon and you can take it off the shelf and nobody's going to argue about it and that's where you can go. And you can also depend on what the future is. Now, 37, however, changed that. In other words, you cannot no longer be certain what's going to happen over the outside. 
However, 37 itself was not bad. It finally happened, as Fred said, it's worthwhile and necessary. There are problems dealing with the administration of it that needs to be changed. I think many people will agree exactly what those are, I don't know. However, I can tell you that once we had the plans, I could tell companies, Oregon is the only state you can come to but you can depend on that that property can be used for that purpose and you don't have to worry about what the growth might happen to be. So here I'm using that as a sales tool. Businesses like that kind of certainty, yeah. definitely. Good. Nancy? You've asked what makes us feel good. And we are taping this in September when people are coming home from vacations. <laughs> and it's a time when they say, you know what? I went back there, and there in the middle of a cornfield was this, this bunch of houses, and the kids couldn't get to school. Or, you know, uh, our, our church is having terrible problems because this used to be a rural community, and now all these, uh, these newcomers have come, and there's been this clash of, well, of cultures. And I think that uh, we have less of that. Everything isn't perfect, but it, it's, uh, it's the people coming home from vacation seeing other parts of the country that make me feel, hey, this is, this is uh, worthwhile. Interesting. Okay. Well, I think Vic, to me, hit on a lot of it is that there's now a process that people can count on. And it's all sides know that they have a place to go. They know that they can come and try to influence what's happening. And, they, and there is a process for builders to know, even though you may not get everything you want, <laughs> that there, there is a process there. And I think that's very good. And I think the example of what we have succeeded in doing in, in preserving resource land is their just shining example. We're, we're pointed to all over the country for what we've accomplished there. Measure 37 has really thrown a major roadblock in, and we, we, I wish people wouldn't be so slow in getting figured out what we're going to do about it, because we can't just let it hang there as it is right now. The pressure of population growth, both from outside and internally, is going to continue creating problems for Oregon, because you know, you're supposed to preserve agricultural land. Where are you going to have houses for them, how much can we force people to live in dense areas. It's going to require a lot of imagination for local government cities to deal with that. I think they can deal with it if they've got the money. Right now they don't even have the money. So those are the problems I see right now facing us. Well, I, I think predictability is what I would have said. I think it follows the same theme that, that right. you knew you had a process or at least you had some idea of what was going to happen. I, I don't think we would have had vineyards if we had uh, allowed it to just go without any kind of controls. But I think there was balance in that process. And probably the thing that I admire most about that time, and Governor Tia said it, we had a collaborative working relationship between parties, between interest groups, mm -hmm. Uh, that continued for many years in the definition of Senate Bill 100 that has unfortunately for whatever reasons gone away. Uh, I truly believe that if that collaboration continued today you wouldn't have the 37s and other kinds of things that would have been out there and that's where I come from. I'll probably slip uh, back to my days of being an affordable housing advocate and, and point out one of the great benefits of Senate Bill 100 has been that local governmental jurisdictions were not, did not have the authority to impose moratoria on the construction of new homes in their communities. That was one of those and, lawsuits we filed, Fred. And that's, that's a great benefit, and, and Thousand Friends, thousand friends supported, was a, a supported that position, uh, for which I commend them. Proves what Gordon was just there. Uh, Roger. Predictability. Gordon, yeah. Yeah. predictability. Mm -hmm. right. Well, I think of two things. Um, Henry referred earlier to the value in his opinion, and I agree with him, that uh, of the productivity of agriculture that has resulted from Senate Bill 100. It's a, it's a long term and indirect effect, but I think it's really there. Um, when forest products went in the tank in the 80s, 
uh, and we look back on that era economically now, the high-tech boom bailed us out in the long term. I've had uh, talks with, with high-tech officials who say, well, we came to Oregon because the quality of life here is very high and that ends up selfishly in their opinion. I can pay my workforce less here and they'll be happier. And so our livability here is, and that's what Nancy was speaking about too, uh, our livability here is a large, in large part I think due to, it's not perfect, but due to land use planning. And uh, people come from outside the state, we're too close to it maybe to think about it, but they always say, gee, it just feels different. It feels uh, different to drive through Oregon compared to other states. Or? Well, I look at it with my forestry hat on, and <clears throat> I think Center Bill 100 has been very good for the forest industry, forest landowners generally. And the reason is that we see the pressure from other regions, California, whatever, who would love to own five acres of land, forest land in Oregon. And, and uh, in my view, that would be the death knell of forestry because as you have the urbanization of the forest land, you start having more problems with fires, you have problems with people who don't want forestry, com industrial forestry to go on around them. So it would be very difficult to practice forestry. So on the, that's on, answered a half of your question. It's been very good for that. I think in my view, looking back on it and being pretty actively involved all this time in one way or another, I think ultimately Senate Bill 100 has lost the fairness battle. It was finally failed and we had a lot of false starts and efforts to repeal it that did not succeed. But finally, I think it was the view that Senate Bill 100 was not fair in some of the decisions that were made that would stop somebody from being able to do something with their land they felt they should. Maybe it had to do with when they bought it or whatever. And I think um, Senate Bill 100 needed to have found a way, and, or maybe still does, try to find a way to bring more balance and fairness probably into what it was felt to be a system that was a little bit broken. I, I concur with so many of the points made by the other speakers about just taking off on the last point that Ward made, uh, I agree with that. I think when, and I, I, I referred earlier to misuse of zoning, uh, the first time that uh, when the land use program or as a substitute was on the ballot, Measure 37, Measure 7, first time that those, were, those measures were on the ballot and the Washington County, Multnomah County, and Clackamas County voted against the program was when there was uh, not necessarily LCDC required activity, but cities were talking about stream limitations on development next to streams, affecting tens of thousands of owners in the Portland metropolitan area. And I think you have to question whether that's a proper use of zoning, of whether you're getting into, getting into a situation that I've heard Bill Mashovsky say so many times, that one person is bearing all the burden and everybody else is getting the benefit of the regulation and the landowner is not getting any of the benefit, it's just getting the burden. I think people interpret that to be unfairness. Again, that wasn't an LCDC requirement, but it was the Measure 37 talked about that and certainly affected that issue. There won't be any streamside regulations in Portland with Measure 37 on the books, and that doesn't bother me. I think when, when forest landowners have a nest tree that's got an eagle that 300 million Americans want to protect that nest site, why should that owner of that tree and 10 acres around it on all sides have to bear all the burden of the purpose of that regulation and everyone else get all the benefit? I could give many other examples. But I think in the last 15 years we've seen those kinds of policies come forward and people be unhappy about it. I sat down to somebody at lunch yesterday, a couple of days ago, who was in a charter member of a thousand Friends of Oregon. He had a house in the West Hills. They bought three extra acres as a buffer. He and his wife sold the house. They, said they offered the property to the, all the neighbors. They said, no, nah, we don't want to pay for it. We've had it for free for 20 years. So he sold it to somebody else. 
and the city of Portland put an environmental overlay on that. That's not fair. That's not right. And I think that people got their backs up and voted for Measure 37. So land use proponents need to stand up and s cry foul when something's foul or we're not going to get this thing back on the track. Now to answer your main point, the thing that I think is most important about Senate Bill 100, not just the farmland that was saved or the fact that residential markets and cities were effectively deregulated by Goal 10 and that cities couldn't do moratoriums, they couldn't create intentional shortages of small lot housing or you know bans on, on multifamily or the forestry benefits that Ward talked about, it's a compliment to the political leaders of this state, both the governors and the legislators, that this state was able to adapt a system that was put in place in the 1920s to deal with the industrialization you know, of, of, of urban America, before there were suburbs, to the circumstances and the needs of the 1970s and going forward. And it was uh, the ability to look at new circumstances and to say we have a system of zoning that was entire for, uh, intended for entirely different circumstances a half a century ago. We need to change that a little bit significantly. And, and they did, using the process that's been described here of collaboration, both gubernatorial and legislative leadership, and to do something that will work for 30 or 40 years. We're probably ready to adapt it again. Maybe that's what Measure 37 was about. But that, I think, is the most important achievement. And Oregon is the only state in this country to successfully, now it's a little bumpy, 30 years later, to successfully adapt to new circumstances and requirements, something that was put in place in the 20s to deal really with the circumstances of the 1890s. Well, it's a good place for us to take a break here for a few minutes. So we'll do that, let you stretch your legs and catch your breath, and we'll maybe come back for a few final thoughts and see if we missed anything. Well, we'll resume our discussion here with a, a final question uh, for everyone to, to take <coughs> one last comment at. And it, it really does bring us right down to today, 2006, with a little more than 30 years of experience now with Senate Bill 100. And, land use planning in the state. Uh, just within the last couple of years, we've seen one of the biggest changes in the state that several of you have mentioned, which was the passage of Measure 37, which has now required uh, great changes <laughs> in some of the land use plans around the state, and it's still being figured out. And then following that, now there's the uh, what's being called the Big Look group that is going back and, and just taking another big look at Senate Bill 100. So it would appear we've reached something of a watershed moment with land use planning in this state. So to conclude, again, I'd just like to ask all of you to give us your perspective on a couple of things. First, what, what does need to be addressed in, in the state land use planning system right at the moment? Is it an aspect of, of Measure 37 and the compensation issue? Is it a revisiting of the goals, the process, the citizen involvement? And the second aspect, too, is it gets to some issues we've talked about, about trust of government and citizen involvement. What could be done to get people involved again in the way that, that occurred at the beginning of this process, where people showed up at the meetings and, and took a personal interest in and had a stake in these discussions, so that moving forward there is consensus and there is an ability to keep things moving in a direction that's good for individual Oregonians, as well as for Oregon as a state. So let's start in the middle this time and we'll work, we'll work out. So I'll start with Fred here. Thank you. I was hoping being in the middle would give me a chance to work, those, uh, work the ideas over. Uh, in, in my mind, uh, I think the wheels are falling off of the Senate Bill 100 wagon. Uh, and there are uh, probably as many reasons uh, for it as there are people looking at the process. Uh, everybody will have their own favorite uh, reasons, uh, and I guess I'll, I, can, I can start with mine, citing things like the eighty thousand dollar or the uh, the eighty thousand dollars of income to build a house, and the eighty acre requirement. Uh, if anybody had imagined that those kind of regulations would be part of the process, the bill would never have been passed. It would. You, you know, I, I could have killed it with one arm tied behind my back. 
Those are farming requirements, by the those way. Is that right? Those are requirements to build, a, to build a home yeah. in yes. the rural area. Yeah. Uh, we came eyeball to eyeball with a proposal at one time to prohibit the building of any house in a forest zone. And that became a, that became a very personal issue. Uh, and fortunately, we, we found some LCDC commissioners that lived in the city that didn't understand and took them on some trips in the country and, you know, and that went away. But the fact that, that we were so close to doing things like that make people very nervous. Uh, and I think we talked about, uh, about uh, some of the other issues, uh, the point about regulatory takings, I think, have, uh, have been uh, discussed pretty thoroughly. We have an opportunity, driven by Measure uh, 37, to, to redo the problem areas if we have the political leadership to bring the interest groups together that were involved in, and, and we, the, the environmental community, I think, is much better represented now than it was at, at that time uh, because Thousand Friends has, has organized and played a, a significant role in, in providing a, a voice for folks that, uh, that Dorothy almost, uh, the League of Women Voters almost alone tried to provide in 73. And, and there's the, uh, and they, you got the Oregon Environmental Council that, that is also around and active. But they have to see that there is a stake. They have to make some compromises to bring the family together and they have not been willing. They've, they've, been, they've been believing that if you just hung out, you could defeat 37. It's passed, been passed twice by the voters. And if they get the message that they have a stake in, in coming to the middle, and we have political leadership that, that wants to solve the problem, I think, I think you can go through and, and pick and make the list of everybody's gripe and then figure out those you got to deal with and those you don't have to deal with. Okay, good. Gordon, next. Well, I, I think there's probably a couple things. I, I disagree with Fred in one instance. I believe that Senate Bill 100 is still a, a good basic piece of legislation. I think today it would still apply. I think it needs a lot of tweaking uh, to <coughs> rectify some of the situations that were brought up uh, in 37. Uh, I, and I do believe, though, that the framework, the same issues are there. Uh, the conservation and development, I believe people in the state want certain areas preserved. I believe they want development in other areas and they want some predictability in both. Uh, I believe that citizens do want to be involved in their system in some way. I think we have somehow, over the years, unfortunately, taken them out of the system more so. And I believe that, uh, as mentioned, uh, I think, by, by Nancy, that. Uh, one of the issues here is is the their belief in the, in the people who represent them. I quite frankly do not believe that our folks think that their legislature and some of their interests uh, are being represented well. They don't see any collaboration occurring uh, today that occurred in '73. I mean, both parties, all of the interest groups working together. In fact, we had an environment for 15, 20 years during that period that was, I believe, very collaborative that is not existent today. In fact, it's just the opposite. And so I, I don't believe they have touch with the system, and, and I believe if they did, that those values that were represented in 100 would still be there. They'd still be represented in the legislature. There'd still be a place for them to participate. And I think we need to rebuild that part of the system um, in order for people and their representatives to, to do, if you will, the best kinds of things for Oregon, not just what suits the party. Would you suggest anything in particular to promote collaboration? Well, I think it's going to take somebody, you know, I, and I will credit Governor McCall for this. I think that he, he was strong enough and believed and, and had, I think, the respect of, of a lot of folks to bring people together, uh, the right people together, to make something occur. I think we need to have leaders like that uh, to step forward and say it's time that we work together on some kind of solution to the problem of how do we predict, how do we go forward with land use. I don't think we have that that stepped up, at least in the recent years. Good. I'm going to jump back over to Russ next. 
Well, um, I want to go back to one technical point on urban growth boundaries. Um, the original charge was to cities and counties, or cities if, uh, who are the enforcers of boundaries, have enough land for 25 years. That was the original charge. Well, the 25 years is up. You know, deposit another quarter and ask for another 25 years. I don't think we ever faced effectively what we are going to do at the end of 25 years. A question that was often addressed to me as a researcher in that time was, it, should an urban growth boundary be fixed or flexible? We never really, never really decided that. Now, to turning to Measure 37 itself, I would remind us all, there are really two kinds of partitioners that can come in a Measure 37. One who, a, a person who wants compensation for a loss that they perceive. They don't have any development they want. They simply say, my value, uh, the value of my property has been impaired. Secondly, though, is the petitioner who wants to do a development. If you do a development in a neighborhood or in a rural area, neighborhoods aren't really an issue, but out, outside and around urban growth boundaries basically are, uh, if you do a development, and then you, the next door neighbor just bought their property, so they, there's no major 37 claim at all even possible. Uh, it's, a, it's a patchwork that as, as one who's technically interested in land use planning, I just simply don't see how it can work. So I would like to see us find a way to compensate the valid claims, but leave the basically rationally arrived at land use plans essentially in place. And about citizen involvement from your perspective as one of the, the interested right. original parties. <coughs> you see that citizen headed? involvement has become very difficult uh, at, the, at the very technical involved level that the debates usually, usually go forth on now, nowadays. I have seen uh, countless times citizens invited into a process but nobody comes due to lack of interest or lack of understanding of the real issues. So just a, as a natural uh, evolutionary process, uh, the debates go on between the technical professionals and those whose interests, or usually their lawyers and engineers and planners who are involved in, in a particular development. So the citizen development, uh, citizen participation process has basically atrophied, I'm afraid. Maybe there needs to be a new kind of role for citizens in this process that should be explored in this. If so, and I, I think it needs to go back to a visioning process that gets us back to, to rethinking what the whole thing was about. And I agree very much with several who said leadership, political leadership is the issue. Okay. I want to jump now to Dorothy. Okay. Well, of course, I think what we're getting at is our society today is so split to extremes. And I don't know how much we can do until we get things back to the middle. Um, <coughs> I do think, I agree with Russ, that I think we need to get back, touch bases with the people around the state again, and probably when the visioning process might be the way to do it, because people are, the other thing you have to do is get rid of all these computer games and all these television <laughs> programs and everything else, and keep people so busy they don't have time to care about what's going on in the community, and again, the only way you can deal with that is to come up with something that really gets their brains going and thinking about, oh, well, you know, maybe if we did something differently here, life would be better in our town or our area. But I do think that we need to get back and reconnect somehow with the people. Um, and I also agree with the comments that we desperately need different kinds of leadership. We need people, but again, that gets back to this tied to things inside. People aren't getting out and working in the community and working with each other and trying to make things happen as a society. And any, any leader who can get us back to do that again would be very, very welcome. Tall order, but <laughs> well put. I'm going to go back to Ward. I, um, I'm kind of uh, a long-term believer in as an optimist, I think, really. I think land use planning uh, and the system that was created in Santa Barbara 100 is very important to Oregon. And I believe that most or a majority of Oregonians believe that. So I don't think the system is broken. Yeah. Uh, but I do think it's damaged. 
and serious work has to be done to regain uh, a measure of credibility and set it off maybe in a new direction. And I think a system similar to what was done in 1973 would be appropriate. I think it's very, I, I'm a, also a great believer in process. You need to get people involved who can make the decisions and make the compromises that can hold. And that's happened for 30 years. So if we can get another system uh, input that will result in those kind of compromises, that's what I would like to see happen. And I think it's very possible. But again, it's process and political leadership and engagement of the interests that are very important. Very good. Nancy, your thought. I think we ought to remember that much of what we're talking about is not unique to Oregon. The polarization of, uh, is not just happening in the Oregon legislature. It's not just happening on our county commissioners. It's happening all over the country. It's part of, part of what's today. The bowling alone idea that Dorothy and several others of you have, have commented on about how people do not seem to feel the sense of community that they don't do things together is not unique to us. The other thing that I think that I want to remember is that every opinion poll you take of Oregon, Oregonians, talks about their support for good planning, their support for keeping this state livable, their pride, <coughs> the people who moved here, who moved here because this is such a wonderful place to live. Uh, they may not know how we happened to get it that way, uh, but uh, that's, and they also realize what happens when you don't have it. There's more recognition of uh, living out in the woods, uh, the effect that it has on the forest fires and on the cost of fighting fires, the cost of sprawl in servicing uh, homes or developments that are way out there. And it seems to me that maybe there is hope for citizen involvement. The big look gives us a chance to look at what it is that uh, bothering people and uh, see what can be done about it. And I'd also like to put in a plug for Envision Oregon. If you think that Oregonians don't care, you ought to come to one of the Envision Oregon gatherings. There were 500 in Portland just two weeks ago, I think. Uh, I went to the first one, there were 200, and people really cared and wanted to do something. So I, I see hope. A bit of optimism here, so, mm -hmm. Henry. Uh, not too much to add to the comments that have made before. Um, I think the key is uh, good judgment and fairness uh, and a recognition uh, that sometimes gets lost in the shuffle that, that there are values in the process that are competing, but uh, there's not any real value that isn't, there isn't a value that's not legitimate. <laughs> These are all legitimate values, the housing or the farmland or jobs or you know, this or that, and they're, they're, com they're competing values in some operational situation, but they're all legitimate values. And um, if people can remember that, I think there is a, a basis for working out a compromise if you do have the leadership. And um, I think that's missing ingredient right now. Okay. Governor Atia, you had the first word, and <laughs> now you get the last word as well. <laughs> Nancy will understand what I'm saying, but I feel like a candidate at candidates tonight. I think land use planning will remain. I don't agree with Fred that the wheels have come off. I agree there's still dumb and stupid things that are occurring. I have no doubt about that, and that makes it tough in trying to retain what we call land use planning. People participation, it only comes up against when you have uh, mostly uh, trying to, to push out the urban growth boundary. Uh, 
Most of the planning's done. Most of us know where we are. Most of us know what's going to happen. It's pretty well established. And so there's not a need, I don't see, for what was then a big problem statewide. And everybody was involved, and, and plans were being acknowledged, and arguments were going all being back and forth. So when you come to whether there's going to be um, an expansion into the ag area, then there'll be some participation. But the thing we have to remember, don't get excited about, is that we're talking about mostly the metropolitan area, Clackamas, Washington, Multnomah counties. When you get out to eastern Oregon, they have very little concern. They've got their ranches and their wheat farmers, and you know, there's not much going on out there. In the larger communities, there's always a fight that might take place. But I believe that we are satisfied that you know, we do have good land use planning. It's been really tough on those that believe in us because, as I say, really very dumb and stupid things are done. But I, I, I believe that it, it'll, it'll keep going. I have no doubt about that. I think we'll continue uh, this great experiment. And it still amazes me, as I said at the very beginning, that people like that had the background of having come to Oregon for months to get their land, uh, the Oregon of that state would be the first one to come across saying, hey, you can't do that anymore. It's, it surprises me. Governor Nizia, thank you. Thank you. Nancy Fadley, Dorothy Anderson, Gordon Foltz, Fred Venata, Russ Beaton, Ward Armstrong, Henry Richmond. Thanks to all of you for your participation in this discussion. We want to thank Edward Klein with Legislative Media and Debbie Lowry with the Oregon State Capital Foundation as well. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Our pleasure.